The Irish Cinder Lad by Shirley Climo, Climo illustrated by Loretta Kropinski. In Ireland, in the old times, there lived a lad named Beacon. His mother gave him this name the day he was born, for Beacon in, is Irish for little one. It's fitting, she said, as for such a wee thing. His mother loved him all the same and carried Beacon about in her egg basket for safekeeping. Whenever he opened his mouth, she spooned milk porridge into it, and Beacon began to grow. Red hair flamed on his head, and his skinny legs got rounder, and his tiny feet got longer until his toes poked out of the basket. Although the rest of him stayed small, his feet kept on growing. By the time Beacon was thirteen years old, they were so large he'd splash a puddle dry just for stepping in it. Still, Beacon's worries were few enough until his mother died. His father was a peddler and off and away, selling needles and pins and bringing back whatever was needed. To Beacon's astonishment, one evening he came home with a new wife and her three nearly grown daughters. Now you've a man again, and three big sisters besides to watch out for you, his father explained. Watch they did. All three sisters spied on him, and if anything went amiss, they shrieked, Blame little Bigfoot! For that is what they called him. We'd be better off without that good-for-nothing boy, said their mother. At last, she told Beacon, Your big feet are always in the way. It's time you went off to tend to the cows. Cows are fine company, Beacon replied, but I've heard talk of a mean speckled bull. A kick from him can send a man sailing over the rainbow. Stop fretting, snapped his stepmother. Not even a cow could mistake you for a man. So Beacon became a herd boy. Each day at sunup, he led his father's three cows up the hill to graze on purple clover. At sundown, he brought them home again. In between, he sat under an oak tree and kept a sharp eye out for the speckled bull. One misty morning, Beacon heard a bellow louder than a thunderclap. Rocks rattled down the hill, cows galloped about in circles, and Beacon scampered up the oak tree. When he dared to look, it was right into the angry eyes of an enormous bull. The creature's face was white, but splashed with rusty red like the freckles on Beacon's nose. The hoofs were big and broad like Beacon's feet. He twitched his long tail and pawed the ground, ready to knock down the tree and the boy with it. Quickly, Beacon stretched out his hand and scratched him behind the ear, in the place the cows like best. We could be cousins, you and I, said Beacon, jumping down, for we look to be patched together for the same odds and ends. The bull lowered his head with the wicked curved horns, but instead of tossing Beacon, he nuzzled his cheek. From that moment, the bull and the boy were fast friends. Beacon told of his troubles while the speckled bull listened, chewing thoughtfully. The sisters tattle, said Beacon one day. The stepmother scolds. I'm fed only scraps and will soon shrink down to nothing. Not why I'm about, rumbled the bull. Look into my left ear and pull out what you find there. Beacon wasn't surprised to hear the bull talk, for he had begun to suspect that his friend was no ordinary animal. Seeing something white poking from the animal's ear, Beacon tugged on it. Out came a tablecloth and wrapped inside it a whole meal. There was bread and cheese and sausage. There were boiled turnips, a partridge pie, and oaten cakes, sticky with honey. Eat what you will, said the speckled bull. Beacon ate every crumb and licked his fingers clean. Then he rolled up the cloth and tucked it back into the bull's ear. Each day thereafter, Beacon had a noontime meal fit for a chieftain. Each evening, he turned down the crust of bread his stepmother set out for his supper. That boy's vil filling his stomach some way, the woman told his oldest daughter. Tomorrow, hie yourself up to the pasture and find out how. The girl did just that, hiding behind a bush to watch Beacon while he watched the cows. At midday, the speckled bull arrived. She saw Beacon pat him, hand put a hand to his ear, and pull out a feast. The bull is feeding Beacon, she whispered to her mother that night. I saw it. Then we shall butcher the old speckled bull, declared the mother. He'll make a grand stew for us. Eyes closed, Beacon nodded on the hearth. But his ears were open, and he heard every word that was said. At the first light of day, he ran to warn his friend. The bull snorted. 
I'll not end in a soup pot. Get on my back, lad, and we'll soon be gone from here. With Beacon holding right to his horns, the bull trotted up the hill, over a steep mountain and through a wood of beech trees. In a meadow many days from home, the bull stopped. Here we bid goodbye, he said, for it is here that the gray bull and I must fight. No, Beacon threw his arms around the bull's neck. The gray bull shall kill me, for my fate has been foretold. When I am dead, you are to twist off my tail. Beacon stared at him in horror. Never! Where my tail is about. Use it when you need my help the most. The bull nudged Beacon gently. Do as I say. Early the next morning, a bull, gray as the sky overhead, came charging through the trees. The two bulls locked horns and fought throughout the day rainy day. When evening came, the gray bull had disappeared, and the speckled bull lay dead. Beacon sat beside his friend all night. At dawn, remembering the bull's words, he cautiously twisted his tail. It spun around in a full circle and came off at once. Beacon wrapped the tail twice around his waist and then, for the last time, reached into the animal's ear. He pulled out the tablecloth, now bare of food and fresh as new, and carefully covered the bull. Slain, he whispered, which is the Irish word for goodbye. Alone, Beacon continued his journey. Walking down a rocky ridge and into a valley, the stones cut his bare feet, and he was grateful when a gentleman on horseback offered him a ride. Where are you bound, lad? the man asked. Beacon shrugged. I'm going anywhere at all. You could come along with me, the gentleman suggested. I'm in want of a cowherd. Herding is what I do best, answered Beacon. I've this horse, four cows, three sheep, and a donkey, and all of them good-natured. What's bad-tempered is on the other side of my wall. In our hutch. A giant? Beacon exclaimed. I'd like to see one. Take warning, the gentleman waggled his finger. My last herd boy, a lad far bigger and stronger than you. Although he knew quite well that what was meant, Beacon said at once, I'll have the job anyway, if it will please you. Beacon became a herder again, sleeping in a cow shed by night and taking the horse, the cows, the sheep, and the donkey out to graze by day. When they had chomped and chewed up everything in the gentleman's field, Beacon climbed the stone wall to see what grew on the other side. Before him spread acres of gracey meadows and orchards of apple trees bowed with fruit. Beacon knocked stones from the wall until it was low enough for the animals to step over. Help yourselves, he told them. They are hutch has so much he won't mind sharing. Then Beacon climbed a tree to pick an apple for himself. Got you, a voice bellowed. A sword slashed through the tree, chopping limbs into a kindling and sending Beacon tumbling to the ground. Hardly a bite on your bones, a huge and hideous giant poked Beacon with the sword. But a bite is better than nothing. Beacon's teeth began to chatter. The rest of him was too frightened to move. Then he remembered the speckled bull's last words. He pulled off his belt and flung it on the giant. As if it were alive, the bull's tail coiled like a snake about the giant's neck. The giant dropped his sword. Call it off, he croaked. Not ever, vowed Beacon. Not. His eyes fell on the giant's shiny buckled shoot boots. Until you give me those boots. The giant glared at Beacon, but he kicked off his boots. Now be gone and never come back, Beacon commanded. He climbed up on the donkey, caught hold of the bull's tail, and yanked it like a pel bell pull. Promise? The giant's fa face turned purple. P -p Promise, he puffed. As soon as Beacon let go, the belt unwound. With a fearsome howl, the archach bounded over the wall and disappeared. Beacon buckled at the giant's huge boots. Just my size, he said. Then waving the sword, he led the herd home. Some time later, the gentleman told Beacon, Stay home with the cows today. There's trouble coming to the town of Kinsale. Trouble, asked Beacon. Tis the day of the dragon, his master shuddered. Every seven years, that wicked lizard rises from the ocean and swallows the fairest maiden in the land. And what if she does not care for that? Beacon asked. Oh, she has no choice, for she'll be bound to a post. If she's not there, the dragon will blow the sea onto the land, wash away the village, and drown all the people. That is troubled indeed, cried Beacon. This year the lass is Princess Finola, the king's own daughter. He squinted at Beacon. Don't you be thinking of going. The crowd might crush one as small as you. 
Going was just what Beacon had in mind. While his master slept, Beacon put on the giant's boots and thrust the sword into his bull tail belt. Then he scrambled up on the donkey and rode off to Kinsel. Beacon spied the king's castle first, for it was perched high on a headland above the blue-green sea. As he trotted down the hillside into town, Beacon saw carts crowded the shore, crowding the shore and a girl tied to a post at the water's edge. A band of gold circled her shiny black hair, and Beacon knew she was Princess Finola. The scene was strangely silent. Only the voice of the princess was heard over the splash of the waves. Will no one help me, she pleaded. People looked away from her. Some hung their heads, but none moved. I shall, cried Beacon, sliding from the donkey. Let me sharpen my sword on that dragon. I'll look behind you, the princess screamed. Beacon wheeled about. The sea was bubbling as if coming to a boil, and suddenly a monstrous dragon burst from the water. Flames flashed from its mouth, and its barbed tail churned the waves to a froth. Scales plated its body like armor, and the nails on its toes were sharper than daggers. Beacon raised the giant's sword with trembling hands. Beware, serpent, he shouted. The battle began. Ooh, moaned the crowd as the dragon caught, almost caught Beacon in its claws. Bravo, cried the princess as Beacon's sword drew blood. But the creature acted as if the strikes from the sword were pinpricks. By afternoon, Beacon was so tired he could hardly lift the blade. Grasping his belt instead, he hurled it at the dragon. The bull's tail wrapped itself around the fiery jaws, trying, tying them shut. The dragon snorted and heaved, but each move tightened the belt. Soon only two thin streams of smoke curled from its nostrils. With a sizzle, the monster sank beneath the waves, taking the tail of the speckled bull down with it. People cheered and rushed to Beacon, almost crushing him, just as the master had warned. Then he heard Little Bigfoot and saw his three stepsisters ready to pounce on him like three cats on a mouse. Beacon jumped on his donkey. Wait, cried Princess Finola. She reached for Beacon and caught him by the boot. I want to thank you. You're welcome to be sure. Kicking the donkey, Beacon took off down the road as if the dragon still chased him, and the princess was left holding his boot. The next day, Beacon took his herd to pasture, just as always, but now he had only one boot. His bull-tail belt was gone forever, and the tip of the giant's sword was bent like a fish hook. Beacon dug a hole and buried the sword under an apple tree. That's the end of it all, he said. But it wasn't. Princess Finola still had the other boot, and she was determined to find its owner. I'll marry the one whose foot, foot fits the boot, and none other, she insisted. It was he and he alone who saved me from the dragon. The king sent a royal messenger to crisscross the country from sea to mountains which, with orders to find the owner of the boot. Many wished to wed the pretty dark-haired princess. Soldiers and sailors, fishermen and farmers all tried on the shoe. Some stuffed the toe with sawdust and others used sheep's wool, and more than a few wore layer upon layer of thick knitted stockings. Still, the boot was too big for any of them. "'Tis giant-sized,' they grumbled. A year passed before the messenger arrived at the gentleman's house. When Beacon's master slipped on the boot, it slipped right off again. Let the lad have a go at it, he said. A cowherd? The messenger winked at the gentleman, but he handed the boot to Beacon. Why not? Of course the boot fit Beacon as snug as his own skin. He kicked up his heel, grinned at his master, and said to the astonished messenger, I've the mate to it in the cowshed. Soon enough, Beacon was on his way to Kinsale again, wearing both boots and astride the gentleman's fine horse. How grand, cried the princess when he arrived at the castle. We're just the same height, sir, so I know we'll see eye to eye on everything. He grinned at her. You can call me Beacon, he said, for that's what my mother named me. You shall be Prince Beacon, said Prince F Princess Finola. She hugged him, and the lad blushed as red as the hair on his head.